All right, welcome everybody. We'll get started tonight. I wanna to thank you all for being here, of course. And tonight we're here for our dialogue with our artist spotlight, Rodney Ewing. And Rodney has been so generous to allow us to use his art during our more than a month celebration. And more than a month celebration at SFPL is our Black History Month celebration running from January through February. And really, we try to do it all year, long, all year long, but extra special during January and February. So Rodney, we thank you for that. And we are honored that you allowed us to use your images. And I'll just give some quick library announcements and then we'll turn it over to Rodney to share his work. And we wanna welcome you to the unceded land of the Ohlone tribal people and acknowledge the many Ramutush Ohlone tribal groups and families as the rightful stewards of the lands in which we reside. The library is committed to uplifting the names of these lands and community members from these nations with whom we live. We encourage you to learn more about first person culture, land rights, and other indigenous um, writers, artists. And we do all this and I will provide, I put a chat a link into the chat box. It has great links to reading lists about native culture. The library also wants to acknowledge that we stand in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and support collective action to end structural and systemic racism and institutional racism within our own house, the library, and our community that we serve as a whole. The library has an updated racial commitment statement, which I'll also add that to the, the document. This document will serve tonight. I will take notes as Rodney talks, lots of things come up and I'll add those to the document. It has lots of reading lists, lots of links to upcoming events at the library. And we have a library to go service. So you can place all of these books on hold. Anything that um, comes up tonight, you can place those on hold and pick them up. Please wear your masks when you pick up from our library or pick up anything from our beautiful city. We're celebrating our 16th One City One book, and this is happening, launching, starting March 1st. And we'll be celebrating the work of Chanel Miller, whose book is about her sexual assault on the Stanford campus and the subsequent um, court hearings that she had to deal with. So a very powerful book. Pick that up today from your library to go, your friends of the library bookstore, or your favorite local bookstore, Shop Local. We have all these partners associated with this and many events associated with this. So this will run from March to April and have a lot of events like this one. Uh, this is Isaac Julian in conversation with the amazing Judith Butler and Celeste Marie Bernier, who will be talking about the women in Frederick Douglass's life. There is an exhibition at the McAvoy Foundation for the Arts, and it has been extended. So when they do open again, you'll be able to go see this exhibition, make an appointment. It's gorgeous and lush, and I can't wait for this conversation. And it is at a strange time, so please come out March 4th at noon. And the Gorilla Girls, I can't wait for that either. So um Feminist Art Group Movement, come check it out. They have a new book as well. And again, Support Local, Borderland Books is our shout out, and so is Marcus Books, the nation's oldest Black-owned independent bookstore. And again, we want to thank our friends of the San Francisco Public Library for helping sponsor all of these events, particularly around campaigns like One City, One Book and our More Than a Month celebration. And now, without further ado, tonight we have artist Rodney Ewing. Um, Rodney's Ewing's drawings, installations, and mixed media work focuses on his need to intersect body and place, memory and fact, to re-examine human histories, cultural conditions, and events. He is pursuing a narrative that requires us to be present and intimate. Ewing's work has been exhibited at the Euphrat Museum of the Arts, the Drawing Center in New York and in San Francisco, Root Division, Jack, Fli Jack Fisher Gallery, Nancy Toomey Fine Art, Alter Space, ICTUS Projects, and ICTUS Projects. He has been an artist in resident at Recology, the DeYoung Museum, 
as well as Jurassic in Woodside, California, Headline Center for the Arts and Bemis Center for the Arts, all in Omaha, Nebraska, all amazing places. Um, Dejassi is very cool. If you have not been there, go check it out. It's Woodside, fun little drive. Um, Ewing received his BFA in printmaking from Louisiana State University and his MFA in printmaking at West Virginia University. Um, Ewing's most recent work, I can believe, uh, believe is still available online at Nancy Toomey's Fine Art. And he's gonna confirm that with us. And I will put all these links in this doc. You can get to Rodney through our page and we will have time for question and answer at the end of the event. And Rodney, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Rodney. Thank you so much for having me, Anissa. And um, yeah, thank you so to San Francisco Public Library. I know it's been a, uh, uh, a very useful tool in uh, a lot of my work. Um, and I'll even talk about that in, the, in my talk tonight. So i um, glad everybody could come. Um, it's good to see some, some friends on the screen as well. So um, what I thought I'd do tonight is just give you a cross section of um, my body work and talk to you about my process and how, um, how I use a lot of different mediums of different disciplines to, to, create, uh, uh, to create my work. And, and try to use it to be in very specific ways to talk about uh, things like identity and race and, and space. So let me share my screen with you. And we can just go back a few. So, um, uh, a little bit about my background. Uh, I have a background in printmaking. I studied printmaking uh, as an undergrad at LSU and in, uh, in graduate work in graduate school at West Virginia University. And um, there was some, when I got into grad school, there was some, um, there was definitely a, a turning point where I felt that um, printmaking as a single medium um, wasn't doing enough for me to be able to talk about a lot of the complex issues that uh, that I wanted to explore and to create the kind of narratives I wanted to explore. Um, although Printmake was very uh, influential um, and helpful as, as somebody who draws a lot and um, somebody who's kind of process oriented in their work. Um, I started looking at other artists at the time who were using uh, different ways to talk about, about, about some topical issues. Um, and so I just want to introduce you a couple of my, uh, a couple of my influences. Uh, the first, this, uh, this gentleman here, Alfredo Yar. And this is from a series he did called Geography Equals War, where he was documenting um, through, these vid through, these, uh, through these images that were reflected in these oil barrels uh, about this, uh, I believe it was an Italian company who was taking their, um, their toxic waste and dropping it into this, uh, into this small town on, on the coast of Africa. And that just, that just initially just showed me that there's, there's really dramatic and cinematic ways and, um, but still thoughtful ways you can approach these subjects that sort of uh, get, sort of get uh, people's attention. Um, Dora Salcedo, um, I would work for her uh, in a heartbeat if she, if somehow she knew who I was and asked me. Um, this is from one of her, uh, this is a scene from uh, her retrospective that was at the Guggenheim and um, what she did, these are tables that are, uh, you see the, they're ones inverted and in between them is sandwiched uh, mounds of earth that is actually growing grass. And basically um, these are epitaphs for, um, for young men who are losing their lives in South Central, uh, Los Angeles due to, uh, due to gang violence and young boys who are, <clears throat> who are kidnapped and sort of embroiled in these wars in Colombia. And uh, Cildo Merlis, uh, another one of my influences, uh, this is called How to Build a Cathedral. And um, I, forgive me for the slide being so small, but it, um, 
I'll describe it to you. So uh, in this installation is a bed of uh, coins and suspended between uh, the chandelier of, uh, of human bones is a column of uh, communion wafers. So sort of taking these, these objects and within a subject and breaking them down and assembling them in a way that maybe people have never seen before or um, using them to create a different type of narrative about uh, a really painful subject uh, was really attractive to me. So um, I guess we'll start here. This is a body of work called uh, Rituals of Water. And this all started for me back in 2005 during Hurricane Katrina. Um, my family's from Louisiana. I, I, went to I went to school there, as I said earlier. And sort of watching the scenes on television and seeing uh, displacement of, um, of poor people and uh, black and brown people sort of being pushed around and um, displaced by water once again, um, made me really think about how water has been an element um, in the African and African-American diaspora uh, from transatlantic slavery, again, all the way through, uh, uh, through Hurricane Katrina. So I started um, sort of doing a lot of research around that area. Um, and I did a lot of writing first before I really decided about what the images were going to look like. Um, and so when I finally got to the point where I was ready to start this body of work, um, I sourced um, photographs from um, from older archetypes from uh, um, of images of slaves through uh, the civil rights movement. And I did want to just do black and white photographs of uh, black and white paintings rather than black and white photographs. Um, I wanted to make the, have the medium tie closely to the conceptual idea, which was uh, having these, these, these figures look like they're uh, being moved by water, being dissolved by water in some kind of way. Uh, or being composed of water as, as we naturally are. So um, the process became to draw these, these images out first, and then I would dump uh, washes of, uh, of ink and water on the page, and then I would just walk away. And, and what that allowed me to do was sort of create this call and response between myself and, um, and the process was going on. It was, it was no, in some certain ways, I was not in control of what was going on. And then as the series evolved, I started adding another element. I started adding salt to the, uh, to the mixture, which also created this, uh, this texture that you see here in the body. But again, I, I, kept the, I kept the idea and the process the same, doing a, a sort of a sketch of, of the images I wanted to use and then flooding it with, uh, with the, with the, with the uh, with the ink, ink and water and salt solution, and then sort of letting it dry to a point where I could sort of see what I wanted to keep and what I needed to create more detail around and which and what, and what part what I was happy just to have as a sort of like this wash effect. Um, I also started incorporating the text um, into these pieces and the text uh, either rep represents um, synonyms of water or adjectives around water. Um, just to sort of make these uh, these pieces that more, uh, or add to the narrative uh, to the pieces. Uh, another piece from that series. And I'm, don't consider myself a natural painter. It was uh, it was something I definitely had to teach myself during this process, especially uh, especially working with ink, which is uh, in this way, which is really close to watercolor. And uh, I found myself sort of getting into this meditative process behind it. Um, it was very uh, it was a very slow, uh, especially if I wanted to build like really deep blacks because the paper was so thick that it absorbed a lot of water and a lot of ink. Um, so having to go back and forth and and cover spaces over and over and over, over again. Um, you know, it, it gave me a, uh, this certain level of intimacy with the work that I, I, I never really had before, because um, I think most pieces for me up until this time had, had been developed pretty quickly. And um, just to do maybe one or two of these paintings uh, working simultaneously would probably take me uh, maybe a month, maybe a month and a half. And 
and again, I sourced the original material is all from photographs. So about that same time, about halfway through that series, um, uh, since my work is so much centered around narrative, um, and I feel like as uh, as consumers of stories, we um, have a tendency to hold on to a lot of fiction, fictionalized characters. We hold their stories and their events a lot closer to our hearts uh, sometimes than we do of actual individuals. So I wanted to find a way to sort of bridge that that gap, use sort of exploit that love and bring that sort of back into the narrative of actual people. So um, I came up with a body of work called Fact and Fiction, where I started using um, portraits of actual individuals who've gone through some traumatic uh, experiences in their lives. And, and they have these marginalized stories, but also sort of, and they also at the same time use um, popular pieces of, of uh, fiction-based literature to you know, make a more nuanced uh, telling of their story. So for example, this is a image of Henrietta Lacks and um, it's accompanied by um, a line from Milton's Paradise Lost. Um, and it's basically asking a question, um, uh, did I request the maker for my clay to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from the darkness to promote me? And uh, I, I felt that um, what had happened to, her, uh, to Henrietta in her co-opting of her, of her body and her cells without her permission or the permission of her family, I felt that was uh, a really appropriate quote, um, especially since um, I think one of the original uh, versions of uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, the prologue, the opening prologue is, is this quote. So this project, as much as the other projects that I, I go into, uh, it also involved a lot of research. Um, with this, it was researching, sometimes it was researching images um, and stories of individuals and then trying to match text to it. Sometimes I would find um, a story or a really interesting piece of text and hold on to it until I could find an image that, that matched it. Um, this is the image of uh, Emil Griffith, uh, who was a boxer from probably like the late 50s through uh, late 60s, early 70s. Um, and he was a bisexual man. Um, and he always thought it was uh, interesting and kind of strange that um, that more people during his day, during his prime, that more people accepted that he accidentally killed a man in a ring and but rather than accept his sexuality. So I found this quote from um, this Ursula K. K. Le Guin book um, and a quote reads, what is hard is to keep alive on a world you don't belong to. The image of Claudette Colvin. And this poem is about um, being a refugee and thinking about the bus boycotts and the civil rights movement um, and pre-civil rights movement um, for African-Americans in, in America, um, it, it must've felt like it, you were a refugee. There, was, there were certain things that I found in this poem that, um, that paralleled the existence uh, of African-Americans uh, pre-civil rights and during civil rights. Um, you know, standing something that your grandfather did or being a refugee means, you, means you're standing at the end of the queue uh, to get a fraction of, the, of a country. Um, uh, money, pieces of paper with pictures of leaders. Uh, um, these pictures, they stand in for you until you go back, until you go back home. Um, and for those who don't know who uh, Claudette Colvin was, she was uh, the first person who um, refused to give up her bus seat before, uh, now I'm losing her name. Uh, she was the first person to give up her bus seat, um, and the end of, end of, NAACP didn't want to use her for a spokesperson because she was 15 years old and she was uh, pregnant and un, 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 unmarried. Uh, another image from this that same, the same series, um, which is George Stinney Jr. Um, 
he was uh, sent to the electric chair when he was uh, 13 years old for uh, a crime that turns out that he did not commit. Um, and there was something about um, that story, him being 13 years old, <clears throat> um, maybe 80 pounds at the time, um, that it not only struck me about his death, um, but also sort of like the death of that, of the innocence of that town where you can actually look at a 13 year old boy of any color and, and think he was capable of doing something that, uh, uh, that horrendous. So this is a quote from uh, The Little Prince. Um, again, um, I started thinking about uh, narrative and space and um, who occupies spaces and uh, what, to what stories get told in spaces. Um, so I, I came up with this body of work um, or this, this conceptual idea about um, the history of the, of the Fillmore and the Western edition and how it has this history of displacement of, uh, of bodies being being moved. So um, uh, as a lot of people know, like during the 40s, <clears throat> it was a mostly Japanese neighborhood. And um, those individuals were displaced um, and put in internment camps um, during World War Two. And then African, the African American population moved into there and thrived for, uh, for a long time, <clears throat> until about the 60s and 70s, where uh, redlining and urban renewal start taking place and uh, promises of, uh, of, of African-American individuals being able to return uh, to, the, to that neighborhood after it, was, uh, uh, after it was sort of fixed up, um, which, never, which never happened. And so um, I wanted to find a way to talk about the, the Japanese American experience and the African-American experience and, and have their stories intersect in a visual manner. So uh, this body of work is called Untethered. Um, and the whole body works called Untethered Stories, uh, Stories of Fillmore. And it was a project um, that ended up at Nancy Toomey Gallery. Um, and I worked with another friend of mine, Monica Lundy, and we both separate bodies of work um, around this topic back in 2016. So um, these are partial silk screens and um, in part drawings that uh, I have overlapped images of, of as best as I could of both cultures um, sort of being moved and disappeared at the same time. And so a lot of these images um, actually come from the San Francisco Public Library from their, uh, from their archive section, where I was, uh, you know, you were able to go through and, and look through uh, donated photographs uh, from their archive and scan them and photog or photograph them um, as you need. So again, trying to have these show uh, individuals just sitting at the, same, at the same space, but maybe not at the same time. And here I found myself using printmaking again, um, just like it was doing in fact and fiction, but I'm using printmaking in a way where I'm not really interested in making um, an addition or making multiples of, of these images. Um, I'm using printmaking, specifically printmaking in this way as sort of an extension of my drawing hand. And as I was working or getting ready to start working on that body of work, um, I knew I was gonna do work like this. I knew there was gonna be a certain amount of work in, on paper, but I wanna actually find an object that sort of tied both the cultures together and and the contention, uh, the point of contention or uh, the point of commonality was 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 the house, was a home, and what what images or what pieces of the home could I use that were accessible that um, could display their stories and the windows were um, just seemed really um, easy for me. There was there was so much potential with them as far as you know. First of all, physically they're flat. I can print on them. Um, I can print on both sides of the window. Um, as you can see a little bit in the background on some of these, you can see uh, the other side of the image sort of peeking through. So as, as you're walking into the space, you get a story coming one way and get a story going another way. Uh, this is a detail of one of the, one of the windows.
Um, back in uh, 2018, I was uh, lucky enough to uh, be awarded a, uh, a residency at Recology, uh, the city dump. And um, this is an installation shot of the, of the finished work from what I did, from what I did there. It was a, it's a three and a half month residency um, that takes place here at the city dump in San Francisco. And um, I really enjoyed it because it, it gave me opportunity to work um, in 3D again. Um, I, hadn't done, I hadn't done so in a long time. Um, so I had enough space and I had enough tools there to uh, sort of take advantage of working um, in three dimensions again and, and building everything there. Um, and so that when you apply to Recology, you, 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 know, you sort of have an idea, you sort of write a proposal about what you're gonna be doing there. And the idea that I had going into there was totally different from what you're seeing now. I had this sort of this grand idea that I was going to be doing some printmaking and doing woodcuts. And, um, you know, I would go out to the, to the dump and collect stuff uh, every time I went there. And, and the, about the two week mark, I, I got a little nervous because I wasn't quite sure what I was doing. So I actually had to sit there one day and sort of inventory everything that I had there. And once I finished my inventory, I realized that I was collecting detritus from people's homes. So uh, a lot of things you see here, um, the wood that I'm using here is lath, which is, um, or comes to the term lath and plaster, which people's uh, walls should be made, up, be made up. But when you're, when you, when people are reconstructing homes and building new homes, nobody uses this anymore. People use sheetrock. So there's always, there's always this stuff left at the, uh, at the dump. Um, I started finding, um, drawers and uh, and I found a lot of photographs. And so what I realized what I was doing was uh, I was saving parts of people's homes and and I realized like, what I should be doing is sort of creating pieces about the current state of gentrification and this current state of diaspora that's going on in San Francisco within with its residents. So um, these also incorporate a, a a good deal of text that that I've written that I composed, and the number represents the the hour of the day that I came up with this with the pieces of text. Uh, another great thing about the dump is that you have the time, um, so you can collect. So I ended up collecting things and not knowing what I was going to do with them, but it was okay to leave, leave them laying around until I knew what I was going to do with them. Um, this particular piece, uh, started just finding, uh, one basketball. Then I, a couple months later, a couple of weeks later, I found another one and I found another one. They were sort of sitting in my studio and, uh, you know, then I sort of remember the incident that happened in the mission neighborhood where, um, where a tech company sort of showed up to the local soccer game and tried to, uh, move the, the new residents out because they had a permit, um, and these guys have had a regular game in the mission um, like every Thursday for as, uh, for as long as they can remember. And the idea that um, that individuals don't know the term of who got next or they don't know the process of uh, who got next is like, that's what you do in the schoolyard. You you want to get in on a basketball game or a soccer game or whatever court game is going on. You, you ask who has next and you sit and you wait your turn. And the idea they sort of like, um, they interrupted that process and it never occurred to them just that that asked again at the soccer game. This is when it started inspired this piece. Another installation from that, that body of work. Um, I found this suitcase full of photographs. It must have been um, 30 years with the photographs, which all had to be altered because um, because Recology is a public company and you can't use any photographs unless they're altered um, past a certain uh, period of time. And so here's a detail of that. And to find that, that suitcase full of uh, photographs was uh, was strange because that in a sad and, and kind of way, because that means that's the end of that story. That means that um, there was nobody else to hand that suitcase of photographs off to. There was no other family members uh, possibly in that line to sort of preserve that history. Mm 
another piece from ecology. Um, this is a new a different body of work. Uh, this is from a series called Longitude and Latitude. And what I was doing with Longitude and Latitude is sort of creating this intersection between memory and place um, and trying to find different ways to uh, sort of express those memories. Um, so with this one called High Cotton, um, it starts off looking like a typical cotton field. And as, it, as it, uh, the field moves closer to the viewer, you realize it's not cotton, it's um, their actual bones. And um, this is sort of uh, a reaction to um, sort of the love and uh, romanticism that still exists around the antebellum South. And this is my response to it. Um, the actual crop that was actually grown or the, the, actual, the actual crop that was actually harvested was you know, human labor. Um, this is a piece that was uh, done in one of the residencies also from Longitude and Latitude. Um, um, most of these works were uh, eventually shown at Museum of Afri African Diaspora in 2019. Um, so with this piece, it's, it's more about a, the tradition of um, the, uh, the West has with the continent of Africa, how it sort of takes uh, people and resources and um, without permission. And this is sort of represents the sort of the event that's sort of happening now where um, certain amounts of e-waste, electronic waste are being brought back to the, to the continent of Africa to be sort of be dealt with by, by the residents and turn into a, like this new, new type of economy. At some point, um, I didn't want to deal with the figure all the time. I wanted to find a way to create narratives without, um, without always having to attach it to an object or a figure, even though there are figures being projected in this piece. So this was done in 2015 um, at a residency at the De Young Museum. It's called Days and Occasions, uh, 17 Seconds of Black. Um, Days and Occasions is, is one of the few projects I actually sort of rotate back to over and over again. I usually move from, from project to project and usually pick up a different medium every time I, I do a different project. But with this piece, um, the human, the language is so, um, you know, language just goes on forever. Um, there's always different permutations and different ways you can say things. And um, it's always really interesting for me to come back and see how I can use language in a different way to sort of like encapsulate moments. But with this work at, um, at, at the De Young, um, all this, all the text that's generated here is generated around um, Black Lives Matter. And so all the discussions uh, that I was involved in, um, articles I had read, um, things I'd overheard ended up in this piece. Um, and yeah, just sort of took advantage of the space at the De Young um, where I could actually have the text on this paper sort of wrap around these, um, these screens. And so people could navigate it um, physically and conceptually. Here's another view of it. And I'm no longer shot. This is where I, I did the whole work here. So it's um, the curator, Dave, um, Kevin Chen, said it, uh, he measured it. I think he said I did 180 feet of drawing. Um, most recently, um, sort of branching into my interdiscipl interdisciplinary approach to creating work. Um, I was awarded a residency at the Headlands in 2019. And while I was there in the project space, um, I had developed uh, or come up with this idea about using children's blocks to uh, illustrate difference of le the different lessons that black children have to learn versus their white counterparts. Um, I decided to use the children's blocks because it's, it's usually the, the first instrument, the first basic toy that um, as children we use to like learn colors or shapes 
or um, you know our, our, our beginnings of ABCs or numbers. But here, I, I, again, I'm using them to um, illustrate um, the different lessons that Black children have to learn to survive. Um, so I made these these children's blocks are uh, three feet by th three feet by three feet by three feet. So they're almost um, they're big enough that an actual person could, if they're open, could actually fit inside of them. And on the sides of each each one of the blocks um, are these are these lessons from the talk that that's usually given to African American children about how to be safe. So keep your hands visible at all times. Watch what you wear. And so these are a combination of uh, I silk screen images on there. I, I painted the blocks and constructed the blocks. Also during that time, uh, I created this piece based on a conversation I had with my father. Um, many years ago, where he, we were sort of lamenting what had just happened to Trayvon Martin. And, um, and he was talking about um, how what happened to Trayvon immediately brought him back to being uh, a 14 year old kid, a 15 year old kid when Emmett Till was killed. Um, and I could see him sort of turning into this 14 year old again. And he had never really talked about being afraid of anything. Uh, this is a man who did two tours of Vietnam and never really talked about that kind of fear, but seeing him talk about um, Trayvon Martin and Emmett Till in the same breath, um, that story sort of stayed with me. So with this, with this diptych, um, it's me retelling that story, that, that, uh, that event that happened between the two of us. And I decided to construct the places um, this is the Bryant Street store where Emmett was uh, falsely accused of uh, whistling at, at this woman. And <clears throat> this is the structure um, where they took him and ended his life. And to create it, um, I sort of, sort of wrestled with this for a while. Like I could draw it, I could draw the buildings. That would be easy enough, but it, it didn't seem like it, it furthered the narrative any, uh, any further. So. Um, what I decided to do is um, use old building materials to create two old buildings. So these both are construct, constructed out of um, old, old, old housing life. And this sort of brings me up to my, uh, what I've been doing recently. Um, with, uh, with the state and shelter in place order um, that came down last year, and um, me being lucky enough to be uh, close proximity between my house and my studio, it's only um, a couple of feet apart. Um, I was able to uh, create work from home. So um, I had this idea of, uh, I had all this ledger paper that I found when I was at uh, my residency re in, at Recology and I knew I was gonna do something with it, do some kind of drawing on top of it or, do some kind of work on top of it. Um, then uh, I also realized I have this over over the last ten years. I've really gathered this whole, huge collection of uh, silk screens that I've used in really specific projects, and I wanted to to challenge myself, see what I could do with um, existing materials that I because now I have an archive of images. See what I could do with these archive of images, and see what would happen if I combine them in a manner. In a, in a manner that I have written, hadn't really used attendant for, but I could still have these conversations about identity and, um, and race. So I started reconfiguring them and overlaying um, certain screens that I had no intention of them actually having any kind of visual conversation with each, with each other. So um, to keep myself sane, I also gave myself the challenge to create one of these every day and a half last year. And these are all on old ledger paper uh, from an insurance company and which allowed me to sort of create my own paper by, by layering them and attaching them together so I can create any size paper I wanted, any shape paper I wanted. 
And I could also do things like go back in and hand color these, these images to make them a little bit more vibrant. Uh, also during that time, this is my friend Tahiti Pearson. Also during that time, um, I was supposed to be in residency with Tahiti at a, at a residency here in San Francisco called Space Program San Francisco. And again, because of the, the lockdown, we couldn't be in the same space together. And so Tahiti has a practice of, as you can see behind me, doing these, these beautiful, intricate um, designs on paper and on canvas. And he and I met a couple of years ago. Uh, we were both in a group show and we just started talking after that um, about trying to, do some, trying to do some collaboration together. And, you know, schedules being what they are, it was kind of hard for us to get together, but space program sort of made that happen because when during their, they had an opening and Tahiti and I ran into each other again. And so when they asked us like, what do you guys want to do? We both said separately, like, yeah, we want to work together. So what ended up happening because of the quarantine, um, Tahiti would pre-cut work and then he would mail it to me. And then I would silk screen on top of that work and then sort of send him images back. So this is another one of his pieces. So we end up doing pieces like this together. So um, this is cropped. So I think this is about five feet long in total and about maybe three feet, two and a half feet, two to three feet uh, wide, I mean, in, in, uh, in height. And um, it was uh, it was daunting and, and and a lot of fun at the same time because you know I really respect his work and he I respect the time that he puts in to to make all these cuts and the last thing I want to do is like you know get it here and <laughs> and print something on it and it doesn't work. And there's another one of the images to color our collaborations what he did and yeah so. We did nine pieces, I think, in total, and over from the period from April to about June or July of 2020. Um, and we had really no communication. There was no really no communication about like where I would ask him, like, okay, you know, this is what I want from a cut, or he wasn't asking me about like, oh, this is what I want. This is what I see you printing on. On the pieces that I cut, it was uh, it was definitely a, a true sense of collaboration where um, where we sort of made this thing, this third thing that was a uh, that was that was neither one of our bodies of work, but it was it was something we we created together. And uh, every time Tahiti would send me something, it was always some kind of new kind of process. So this one's mounted on wood. Um, this last one uh, is where you can see where he's, this is actually, in, he cut out the pink section here then replaced it with uh, a, a section that was cut and placed back inside. So it would take me a couple of days to figure out what images that I wanted to print over print the print to go go along with his work. And that's the end of the slideshow. So yeah, um, as you can see through my my body work, I kind of move in a in a lot of different ways and and I, and a reason why I do that is, is simply because I'm just trying to find the best way to communicate ideas to the viewer. So sometimes it's a sometimes it's a print, sometimes it's a drawing, sometimes it's installation, maybe sometimes it's all three. Um, but it's 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 viewer first, and then anything that I any kind of skill that I have, any kind of knowledge I have about art making, it's always used to uplift or enhance that story or that subject. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rodney. That was wonderful. Such beautiful work. 
And we're going to open it up to questions. You can put your questions in the box or you can go ahead and, you know, unmute yourselves. And I, I'm going to sort of stay in the background. Oh, let's see. I mean, I can help you like find some questions, but I don't see any quite yet. I'll start. How about I, I, I get the ball rolling? Oh, there we go. Oh yeah, I have a question. Hi, hi, Ronnie. Hi. <laughs> it's Sophie. Um, hey, Pudding. So, yeah. <laughs> hi. Um, so I have a question as as a you know a young artist who's looking to walk that fine line that you walk where you don't really shove your point down um, the viewer's throat, but you really like let them find it out for themselves. I'm really wondering how you walk that line. Like if you have any tips for that and any tips for finding um, a concentration that is really meaningful to you. Uh, I, th I think it all boils down to intent for me. Um, my, my intention is to, uh, is first of all, is to honor the subject. So um, in some ways, so there's a lot of ways I have to step back and, <clears throat> and not make this like, oh, just look at this cool thing that I can do. Um, even though at the same time, I want to make sure I'm bringing all my skills to bear. So it, so it, it, so on a technical level and aesthetic level, all that's being uh, all that's being used and all that's being highlighted. But what I guess what I'm looking for is 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 sort of that that civil dialogue. Um, I'm looking to communicate ideas and start discussions and um, even have disagreements. I could be wrong with with some things that I put out there. Um, you know, some things could be offensive, um, but. I think what all boils down to for me is making things accessible. So that's kind of the line I, I kind of walk. There's, I guess you can say it's a guideline, it's um, or it's a structure, or it's some kind of foundation. But um, it it sort of keeps me. Um, it kind of sort of keeps me on this path of making things that are bigger than myself, that are, that aren't about me. If that makes any sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. And um, just by the way, I, I love you and I'm very proud of you. And I think all your work is incredible. Oh, mm -hmm. thanks, Self. Love you too. <laughs> there is a question in the chat box. Um, where can we see some of your work in person? Is, if SF MoMA or, well, I have a, I'm in a group show, SF MoMA. Uh, that hopefully opens again in March. Um, it's called um, Creativity in Crisis. Um, and it's basically um, artists doing work during during the pandemic. So um, it was curated by Corey Keller at SF Mama. So um, uh, I just saw Instagram this, this week that uh, they finished the installation and um, so yeah, the museum just needs to be open and, um, and people can come view it. Um, there's also a group show that should be happening at um, St. Joseph's Art Society. Um, I'm not sure when that's gonna happen again with everything sort of being on lockdown right now. Hey Rodney, it's Michael, I have a question for you. Hey Michael, good to see you. Oh, it's so good to see you. Um, just a fantastic slideshow. That was a real treat to see it all. Thank you. Um, your art has always been so timely and it just seems so reflective of the times we're living in right now. I'm curious to know if you've noticed an uptick in uh, an audience for your work and maybe a, a more mainstream audience for your work since so many of your themes um, have sort of played themselves out in the last year and certainly during COVID. Yeah, I, I think there's actually, there's been a lot of attention to um, not only my work, but a lot of individuals who do work like this. Um, and I think, well, I can only speak for myself, but um, you know, I've been doing this work for a long time or doing, dealing with these kind of themes for a long time. And, you, you know, fortunately, unfortunately, um, you know, our nation is at this at this point where um, all these things are being expressed in over different medium, over different platforms, and, and arts just being one of them. And you know, uh, 
I'm just telling my story. I'm just telling my viewpoint, and it's it's art is my filter to to sort of figure out um, how to handle a lot a lot of these things, uh, a lot of these pieces, um, and a lot of the, the, th the things going on in the world. So um, yeah, I'm glad to see that people are paying attention to my work and 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 friends' work who are um, who are dealing with these issues. But um, I think what the art community really needs is uh, a consistent um, voice with this um, coming from galleries and coming from museums and coming from institutions, um, sort of challenging who's who's making this work and 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 not you know not making a special event, not making it um, not making a one of where it's but a constant dialogue that's always happening within these institutions. Well, you are certainly one of those voices and have been for. 20 to 30 years. I echo what Sophie Young says. I love you and I'm so proud of you. Love you too, brother. Thank you. I have a YouTube question. Um, what does a workday look like and where does reading and looking for research and how does that fit in and where does it fit in? Um, a workday um, for me looks probably like a workday for everybody else. It looks like this on a Zoom. Um, I teach full time, so I'm on the, I'm on Zoom from anywhere from uh, eight thirty in the morning until three thirty in the afternoon. Uh, yeah, uh, research is kind of staggered for me. It's a lot of things that I'm sometimes a lot of things that I'm some things that I'm doing currently. The things I've been re I've researched maybe three or four years ago. So, for example, the the piece at uh, that I did at the Headlands. Um, you know, I had made those those children's blocks. I actually made children's blocks out of paper and sort of had them laying around. I had those sitting around for like four or five years. And then when Headlands came around, I was like, you know, I, I panicked for a second, like, oh, I don't know what I'm gonna do in this space. I'm like, yes, then it, you know, I sort of calmed down and figured out like, oh yes, you have already done the research for that. You've already done the work for that. So now you get to make these. <clears throat> so um, things that I'm reading right now, might not appear, you know, for a year, maybe six years, maybe 10 years. Um, it's, um, it's, it's, it's a long process for me. And um, it used to frustrate me like, oh, I need to get these things out quicker, but it's, I'm, I'm okay with just sort of being slow and sort of meticulous mm -hmm. about the things that I'm making. Um, and yeah, uh, I try to, you know, I try to make work after my work day's over or on weekends and things like that. Yeah. Thank you. I had a question. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thank you. Oh, good. Okay. I wanted you to talk a little bit about Doris Salcedo or however you pronounce her name. I saw, saw her show at the um, at SF MoMA and I was moved by her work as well. I think that I remember the shoes, the mm -hmm. little the shoes in the, um, I don't know if they were boxes made out of skin, but could you talk a little bit about how her work uh, resonated with you? Because there is a similarity, I think, as far as the intention. There is a sense of mourning and loss that I, I see in her work. And the different way she approaches it and the different materials that she approaches it. The, the materials that she used are all very specific and profound. And um, it, it's, it's almost hard to put in words, at least for me. Um, mm -hmm. When I saw that, that, um, that retrospective at, at the Guggenheim, um, you know, each room, each floor, each object was very specific in its intention. Um, but the overall, for me, the overall theme was this, this encapsulating this sense of mourning and a sense of loss. And, um, and the materials, you know, whether it be um, a garment made out of burnt needles or a room of uh, a rose, of rose petals, a flower petals, petals that have been, have been stitched together or the large furnitures that she's reconstructed mm -hmm. um, that are filled with concrete or again, the, 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 the shoes um, that also represent loss that are, embedded within the walls, each one of those have, a, have their own specific voice 
but they sort of lend themselves to the to the whole choir of of her of her body of work. And there's um, they're beautiful, um, but they're beautiful to again um, to highlight that subject uh, or, or highlight that that certain condition um, in that body of work. It's so personal on the one hand, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you're talking about loss and you both do talk about loss, um, both personal and society in, in society. So um, thank you for, yeah, um, uh, expanding that a little bit. I appreciate it. No, you're so welcome. Hi, Rodney? Yes. Hi, it's, it's Catherine. I Hi. actually, I had trouble getting in on the Zoom so then I went to YouTube and then I couldn't figure out how to contact you. But anyway, here I am. And actually, if I can do this correctly, I can show people another. There we go. Rodney Ewing. Oh, sweet. Ah, yeah. Which I, I loved your talk. I, I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, and that was just it. I, I thought I would show you large work because the first time I saw your work, you had done something of course, of uh, the, the bombing um, in Philadelphia. And I've since become friends with um, Young Africa, Mike Africa. So anyway, thank you for the talk. It was wonderful. And thank you for your art. It just, it helps us get through these horrible days too. Oh, you're so welcome, Catherine. And, <laughs> and thank you for always for your support. Oh, uh, really my pleasure. Absolutely. There's a couple more in the chat and, you know, uh, feel free again to unmute yourselves. Um, beautiful work. What was the scale of the Emmett Till wooden buildings? Do you design how your work is installed? That is hardware and logistics. And <laughs> no one mentioned you were in a group show at the main library at the African American Center. <laughs> we love you. At the library loves you, Rodney. <laughs> um. So the that piece called um, the piece with the uh, about Emmett Till uh, that piece is a uh, forty eight by ninety six. Um, it's on two panels. Um, yeah, I have a an idea about how I want things um, installed. Um, you know, when it's when it's two D work, it's you know it's easier. Um, I, I really don't concern myself too much with it, um, but things like the windows, um, uh, the way they were hanging in that in that shot, um, yeah, there's loosely kind of you know I kind of know how I want them to look. Um, uh, the children's blocks they've been installed, um, they've been installed in one other place, uh, and the curator there, um, the. The, the trail of paper that exists inside the box before you get to the children's box, he, he found a really innovative way to, to install them on the wall. I need to ask him how he, how he did that one day. Um, and, it, and it worked out for, for that space as well. Um, but yeah, I guess as probably as I, I get more complex in my work and I have really specific ideas about how I want the work to read, um, yeah, I'll get involved in that, but I'm also really open to like, you know, that curatorial eye or, or uh, that somebody else's eye that maybe I'm missing, uh, I'm missing something uh, in installation and, and I'm certainly open to it. Thank you, Rodney. Mm -hmm. Anyone from our, our meeting room want to ask Rodney a question? Give it a few more you know, 15 seconds to let those questions come out. Okay. Also, I wanna remind everybody, Rodney, you, you, I'll ask the last question. Um, so you have those quotes, which I love. You're like a librarian's dream. I put lots of links that Rodney talked about during his event in that chat box. So you can find all that stuff, but the ones where you had the quotes, did the quote come first or did the art come first? Um, 
kind of both. Sometimes it was the art came first and sometimes the quote came first. Excellent. Yeah. And there's a, one other question from uh, my friend Ramakan. And he says, um, um, how do I navigate the difficulty of expressing private world of black experience in a public arena? Um, yeah, I think we both, you and I both, and, and a lot of our friends who, who, are, who are black artists, we, we, we have to navigate that all the time. And, you know, how much do we tell? Um, and how do we, how do we present that in a space that that's usually not for us? And that's usually what I'm thinking about. It's like, how do I present these ideas then in spaces that usually we're not, we don't, you know, we don't have the access to, or people don't usually find at work in. And, and I think for me, it's just thinking about what story I want to tell and, and how to construct that in a way that's, again, as I said earlier, make it accessible, not acceptable. I think those are two different things. Um, I think I can still make work that's accessible and, and it's still, and it's still loaded with all the, the trauma and, and grief that, um, that sometimes it goes along with, you know, being who we are and in our history. And I, I feel as long as I'm making those, those, those distinctions very clear, um, then then I can find my I can I can find myself sort of making that work and and bridging that gap and 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 sort of bringing people across that gulf to like this is what I'm going through or this is what this is what my history is this is the history of my people and and this is some of the the experiences that we have and um, and hopefully if they look hard people who look hard enough they can find some universality in that. Thank you so much. All right, I am gonna, hello again. Um, I wanna thank Rodney for being here and everyone can feel free to unmute now and give the, we're in a meeting so we can actually see each other and hear each other. So unmute and let's give Rodney a big hand and uh, much love for sharing your work with us and the library. Thank you. Thank all of you for coming out. Thank you, Rodney. Talk at night Thank you, Rodney. And hanging out with me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, hello. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Bye. You. Thank you. Bye. Hey, Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Good night, everyone. My Baltimore family says hi. Uh, <laughs> this, one, this one is a little too late for them, but next time. <laughs> What's um, tomorrow? Okay, okay. okay. Thanks a lot, Rodney. That was awesome. Thank Fantastic. you, Michael. Really great. Hey, Amy, what's oh, up? Hey, Rodney. <laughs> it was so good to hear you talk. It was so good to your see face. you. 